Hello again, I'm Joshua Maloney, the Supplemental Instructor for Professor Edder's Intro to Environmental Science at Cape Cod Community College. This is a recording of my presentation, and I hope it helps you when you make your presentation. Stick around until the end for some resources and tips. My topic is the threats to Massachusetts forest trees. On the left, note the 1830s agricultural-rich Massachusetts. When talking about the Massachusetts forests, and the threats to them, I think it is important to consider what our forests have consisted of and what post-settlement problems Massachusetts has overcome. Then, we can look at what problems we still face today with local sustainable forests. On the left side, the Harvard Forest Black Gum Swamp Pollen Study shows vegetation changes throughout time that are typical from sites across America. An examination of sediment cores from Martha's Vineyard and Plymouth County suggests a species composition not unlike that of today. Periodic wildfire in a largely dry land environment favored a forest of sprout hardwoods interlaced with pitch and white pine, with rare species such as chestnut, beech, hickory, and even hemlock. We can see a short chestnut tree span in the area. The first documented description of the Massachusetts coastal forest are by Samuel de Champlain. It was not a flattering description as he named it Cape Blanc because of how it looked to him. Later, in 1616, John Smith dismissed Cape Cod as a headland of high hill and sand. But in 1620, the pilgrims described the area much better. Their accounts described Cape Cod soil as excellent and black. The forest consisted of oaks, pines, sassafras, juniper, and others. Having been accustomed to the order of the scarce English forests, and having been at sea for months, wild New England must have appeared a land simply awaiting their settlement. The differences between a blank dreary cape and the excellent description given by the pilgrims could be from the untrained or hopeful eye but it also could have been the pilgrim's desire to send the right image back to England. The apparent abundance of natural resources to the pilgrims must have appeared staggering. Now, I will elaborate on what post-settlement problems Massachusetts has overcome. These include natural disasters, human deforestation, and invasive pests. Slide, please. The hurricane of 1938 was the most destructive storm in Massachusetts history. Several factors conspired to make that so. Days before the storm, it had been very wet, saturating the soil and predisposing the trees to wind throw. Comparing hurricane paths and damage, it is estimated that Massachusetts had a young forest in 1938 and was unable to protect itself. When nearly 3 million board feet of timber was blown down across Massachusetts, we had unintentionally created the most vulnerable landscape possible. Forest fires are very healthy. They can be incredibly destructive and deadly to young forests. Early forest fire methods focus on suppression. But in 1924, a study on Cape Cod by several local, state, and federal agencies found that fire prevention is cheaper than fire suppression. Another traditional threat to the Massachusetts forests have also been deforestation. Unlike the Native Americans, the colonists had sawmills and draft vehicles. They were capable of harvesting larger trees, and the English tradition of joining pieces of wood together also made it possible for smaller dimensions to be used. By 1631, the Massachusetts General Court had to begin acting timber control ordinances regulating forest burning and the felling of trees to start rationing hardwoods for fuel sources. Our woods were likely managed via the copicing system which means trees would be harvested very young, every 20 to 40 years, left to re-sprout, and then gathered as soon as the growth was big enough to burn. Copicing is hard on a forest's stumps, roots, and soils, and this led to a scarcity of wood by the early 1800s. This probably accounts for many of the stone walls built along boundaries. Another major threat to Massachusetts forests have been pests. The gypsy moth, a non-native and invasive pest, was introduced in 1868 by a visiting Harvard University instructor, Dr. Leopold Travaux. He was trying to create a new subspecies of silkworm that would live in New England. 
His idea was essentially to crossbreed the Asian silk moth with the hardy European gypsy moth. I think it should be noted that Dr. Leopold Travaux was an astronomy instructor, so this project seems a bit out of his wheel well. Somehow, some gypsy moths escape, and Travaux's warning of their potential danger went unheeded. Travaux will always be remembered, not for his astronomical art, but as the person who introduced the invasive gypsy moth into the United States. In 1889, the Massachusetts gypsy moth population reached alarming proportions, and in 1890, legislature directed action. Despite massive efforts, the gypsy moth spread to every city and town by 1922, and has remained a significant threat to forest health and the state. Early removal methods were physically labor-intensive and required physically removing. See the men in the tree on the right. The photo on the left shows gypsy moth defoliation. The brown tail moth is another non-native invasive pest. It was introduced to a flower shop in Somerville, Massachusetts in early 1890. That's roughly the same time. After an 1897 storm scattered moths from Somerville all over Massachusetts, the state's directed action. Ten years of work to eradicate the moths worked so well that the government recommended another committee to evaluate the benefit of the work. This committee essentially reported that Massachusetts did not have a moth problem. So, during the next five years, unencumbered by any control programs, what do we think happened to the brown tail moth? Any guesses? That's right, their populations exploded, and in 1905, Massachusetts legislature had to act again. The introduction of sprayers mounted on motor trucks in 1911 made spraying with lead arsenate pesticides and applying creosote to egg masses the control method of choice. During those times, both of these methods were described as beneficial to the crop and detrimental for insects. This is a 1922 Town of Barnstable notice to all citizens that shows that the problem did not go away. For Cape Cod, 1948 was the first large-scale application of the life-saving chemical DDT, when 7,000 acres on Lower Cape Cod were sprayed. The following year, 250,000 acres were sprayed on the Cape. It was said that wildlife and burns remained more abundant than ever. Collateral benefits included the lack of weevils in white pines and an 85% reduction in tick population. So, looking forward, what problems do we face today maintaining local sustainable forests? We now know that DDT was not the panacea chemical we once thought it was, and it caused many problems. So what does keep these insects at bay? Are there sustainable forest cutting practices? Also, let's take a look at this picture. Always remember safety first. So what does keep the pests away? Was it the DDT, the lead arsenate, the creosote? No, not really. We recently found out that it is more natural enemies and disease that has helped keep the gypsy moth away. Though they still pose threats, such as the defoliation that occurred in 2017, and they will continue to happen. Currently, the state does not participate in or fund any treatment programs. So what happened to this 190-year-old deforested Massachusetts? In the broad-scale abandonment of farmland, Massachusetts, like much of New England, reforested itself over the last half of the 19th and 20th centuries. This map shows that Massachusetts is much more forested than it was in 1830. So maybe John Smith's and Samuel Day Champlin's account of Cape Cod was not very far off of the forests of eastern Massachusetts. Maybe they were a lot smaller than forests across the world. Despite humans' best efforts, Massachusetts is doing a great job at regreening itself. In conclusion, our forests are lusher now than they have been in the past several hundred years. We are likely to face similar problems that we have faced in the past. Profit-driven deforestation, natural disasters, which humans are often unknown accomplices to, so I hope my presentation was helpful, and hopefully it can help guide you while you make your presentation. Reach out to me, Professor Etter, or the Tutoring Center if you have any questions. Again, this semester I will be holding weekly study sessions on Tuesday, so reach out to me to attend those.